Ahead on our news tonight, Caribbean leaders met with U.S. Vice President on a number of issues that include climate change. Prime Minister Davis tests negative after contact with a U.S. Congresswoman who fell ill. And let's take an inside look at the Ranfurly Home for Children. Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. I'm Megan Shepard. Caribbean leaders, including Prime Minister Philip Davis, met with U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris via Zoom on Friday. Topics on the, agen on the agenda rather included security, economic recovery, COVID-19, and climate change. And the challenge is being able to always bounce back from these incidences and financing. Um, a huge part of the debt in the Caribbean region is, is directly linked to natural disasters. And so how do we, how, how do we, how are we able to either forgive debt, uh, how are we able to finance debt, um, and keep countries on footing? Without these issues, many of the Caribbean countries will be able to do well financially. The Bahamas has had to grapple with the impact of major hurricanes, in particular the unprecedented devastation caused by Hurricane Dorian in 2019 and the COVID-19 pandemic. OPM Press Secretary Clint Watson says the Bahamas is a prime example of how climate impacts a country's economy. The Bahamas, billions of dollars in debt, just linked to one storm. Uh, so talking about that, how, how to handle climate change issues, what's being done by the world on the countries, because Caribbean countries aren't the polluters, aren't the ones uh, contributing to a lot of the issues in climate change. So how do we get the world to pay its way? Meantime, Prime Minister Philip Davis tested negative for COVID-19 after coming into contact with U.S. Congresswoman Maxine Waters earlier this week. According to OPM Press Secretary Clint Watson, U.S. media outlets report that Waters tested positive for COVID-19 and is currently isolating. We were aware Prime Minister has tested uh, since then twice. Um, he has also done a PCR test. All have come back negative. Waters paid a courtesy call on Davis at the office of the Prime Minister, where they discussed the relationship between the Bahamas and the United States, including the financial sector and crypto space, tourism, climate change, and carbon markets. Davis also traveled to Miami, Florida this week, where he addressed the Caribbean Renewal Energy Forum. State Minister for Economic Affairs Michael Halkid is crushing the opposition's calls for the Davis administration to remove value-added tax off bread basket items. Halkid is telling reporters today that it's simply not happening. Jasmine Brown has his explanation in this report. The State Minister for Economic Affairs joining the recently reignited discussion about removing value-added tax off bread basket items after he was asked to respond to the opposition's repeated calls for the Davis administration to do just that. It's not feasible. When we did, let me go back again. When we first introduced it at 7.5%, our advice, after considerable deliberation and discussion and back and forth with the private sector, with academia, with scientists, um, scholars, the best policy is to have a low rate with minimal exemptions. In Parliament on Wednesday, Education Minister Glennis Hannah Martin and FNM Deputy Leader Shannon Don Cartwright clashed after Cartwright argued the government should reverse its decision to place VAT on bread basket items. The Christie administration implemented VAT in 2015 at a rate of 7.5 percent. Three years later, the Minnis administration increased the rate to 12 percent and introduced a zero rating on bread basket items and medication. But on January 1st, the Davis administration reduced VAT from 12 percent to 10 percent and got rid of zero rated items. It's a good political point to beat, right? But recognize that when you begin to introduce exemptions, the only way you can do it is if you pay a higher rate on everything else. And so we've studied this, we've gone back and forth. Our best advice is a lower rate, hence the 10%, lower than, than the 12 but with minimal exemptions because it's more efficient. Now, in addition to addressing value-added tax, Halkidis also gave an update on his recent meeting with the International Monetary Fund and World Bank. He said the international bodies have taken notice of how the economy is bouncing back as more and more restrictions are lifted and tourism arrivals increase. Everybody is concerned about the um, levels of inflation 
that are impacting economies around the world. And as well, the issue of climate change was high on the agenda and how countries, particularly uh, small vulnerable countries like ourselves, um, are impacted and what we can do. Now, while Halkita says there are no plans to remove VAT off bread basket items, he does say the Davis administration is working on other initiatives to combat rising prices. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. A recent meeting between the Davis administration and the Petroleum Dealers Association went well. That's according to State Minister for Economic Affairs Michael Halkidis, who says Thursday's meeting consisted of the association presenting more proposals to the government, though he declined to say what those proposals were. Now, we had some initial discussions. They presented a proposal to us. We went away. We um, crunched some numbers. We had a meeting again yesterday to further the discussions. Uh, they presented some additional proposals uh, to the government. We are looking at ways. Prime Minister attended the meeting and he said to them that he is committed to bring some relief to them. It's just a matter of working out how best to do it so that we actually get the relief. They presented some more proposals to us yesterday. We undertook to go and study them and come back to them with a position, um, hopefully to assist them, well, the idea is to be assist, to assist them effectively before we get to the budget, so in the next two weeks or so. As the war in Ukraine rages on, prices at the pumps are continuing to climb. Earlier this month, Vice President of the Bahamas Petroleum Dealers Association, Vasco Bastian, warned gas prices could reach as high as $8 per gallon this summer. Halkidis and Prime Minister Philip Davis have met with the association two times in recent weeks to discuss the issue. And here's our Greg Thompson with a first look at weather. Greg? Thanks, Megan, and welcome everybody for our first look at weather on this beautiful Friday evening. Partly cloudy skies outside our studios right now. Temperatures in the mid to upper 70s. Easterly winds at 7 miles per hour and those comfortable temperatures in the mid 70s. Satellite view across the area, that stationary frontal boundary hanging out across the northwest Bahamas. Some showers and isolated thunderstorms associated with that boundary affecting the Northern Islands. That boundary will continue to hang out in our area for at least another 24 to 36 hours. So across the Northwest Palmas, we're looking for some more showers throughout the night and into tomorrow. That's your first look at weather. Your extended forecast is still to come. Still to come, the Minister of Tourism says May bookings look promising. That's coming up when our news returns. our news welcome back the month of may is looking promising for the number one industry according to deputy prime minister chester cooper our Bethany mcdermott reports what's usually a slow month for the tourism industry is looking quite promising this year according to tourism minister chester cooper cooper said so far hotels are reporting strong bookings for the month of may we know that even during the slow month of may when we look at fall bookings that all of the major hotels uh, are seeing very strong occupancy levels. And then we go into the high peak summer months. According to Cooper, officials are expecting arrival numbers this year to rival pre-pandemic levels. He noted that there's great demand in the family islands, which are being promoted as low COVID environments. This as COVID-19 restrictions are being relaxed and the country is beginning to rebound amid the COVID-19 pandemic. He says the relaxed restrictions make the Bahamas a more appealing destination. We are monitoring the restrictions in line with the advice of the professionals. Uh, we want to ensure that we strike the right balance, as I always say, uh, between growing the economy, growing tourism and the health and welfare of the Bahamian people. We take advice from the health professionals, but we recognize that people are fatigued uh, with COVID. Uh, they don't want to wear a mask any longer. And this is a competitive business, and therefore we will listen to our clients, but at the same time do its best. Cooper says the response from the main market of the United States has been good, adding the plan is to increase traffic from the UK. 
Cooper was speaking after a panel discussion at the Crypto Bahamas Conference at the Bahama Resort. Officials say 2,000 individuals registered for the event. This is what we've been talking about when we talk about tourists with a purpose. So this time they come, they will stay at our hotels. The economic impact is uh, really good for the country. Uh, they eat at restaurants. Uh, Bahama is full, all of the restaurants, you can't get a, a reservations, rental cars, transportation, taxis, people are working, uh, caterers, etc. So this is good for tourism. Reporting for our news, I'm Berthony McDermott. The Providing Access to Continued Education, or PACE, renamed its East Street and Plantall Street building the Andrea Archer Institute today. PACE originated back in 1969 through an initiative in the Ministry of Health led by Archer, who paved the way for what the Institute has evolved into today. Education Minister Glennis Hannah Martin and a wife of the Prime Minister, Anne Marie Davis, called Archer a trailblazer. I personally think um, Mrs. Archer is a hero, and I want to say that I am so proud to know you. I am proud of you as a Bahamian woman. I am in awe of your courage, because as Ms. Brown pointed out, you had to fight against the pricks, the status quo. Mrs. Archer. You have established yourself as a friend of women and underprivileged girls. Your tireless efforts on behalf of those less fortunate are the qualities which will endear us all to you today and always. The program gives pregnant students a second chance to continue their education. Honoree Andrea Archer said the journey was not easy. It took courage stamina and fortitude to act despite the negative criticism and vilification to ensure that rice was cooked. <laughs> Patience is a bitter plant, but oh, its fruit is sweet. A new magnet school in the Bahamas is showcasing kids in technology. And get the scoop on the upcoming series, a Spotlight on Digital Transformation. We have the details when our news returns. called a magnet school and the International School of Business, Entrepreneurship and Technology is boasting of being the first of its kind in the Bahamas. Opened in August of 2021, founder and Senior Director of Operations Mitzi Turnquist says that everything in the world has been changing consistently. However, education in the Bahamas has been stagnant. How cool it is to know that you have kids here who have now within seven months know how to create their own website, know how to code things, know how to code games, know how to code robotic robots all over the place. And so that's so impressive. So imagine in seven months, we, these kids can learn this thing. What can they learn in three years? What can they learn in five years? And so it's just now preparing kids to be able to be marketable, to be skilled, to be able to be attractive for the future world. There are currently 25 students enrolled in grades four through 11. Turnqua says she believes this new kind of schooling puts Bahamian students at the cutting edge of learning in the 21st century. Our goal is to, um, we expand in the fall coming, we expand to fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. One of the things we recognize, even though we are a magnet school, we realize that we don't neglect the core subjects. So we still focus on the math, English, as well as the science. And we understand that even in coming in this environment, a lot of our kids had regressed so much. And then critical thinking was not a part of our kids' makeup. A lot of our kids weren't trained to be critical thinkers. And so much of our curriculum is built on that. And so we find that if we were able to perhaps um, get, that, get them from earlier, we're able to transition them very easily coming into six, into seven, eighth, and ninth grade. Academic coordinator Kelly Frendo says that while the school's core subjects focus on entrepreneurship, computer science skills, and technology, the curriculum also places special focus on other life skills. We're a very non-traditional school. 
Okay, so even our curriculum, because we're focused on business management, entrepreneurship and technology, we obviously give them the English and maths that they need too, because they will be preparing for college. Um, but we also have things like financial literacy. So they learn how to manage their money, how to save, look at investments, even what happens when buying a house is involved, because we feel they need to learn these real world skills. Um, our history is also very focused on business history. So they learn about businesses that have failed and succeeded and take lessons from history in order to apply to business and the real world. A fourth Carifter swim title for the Bahamas over the Easter holidays. While on the locker room today, the team's coach, Trevano McPhee, gives credit to family and friends. We actually, you know, got a charter down there. You know, Bahamas had chartered us, you know, straight mm -hmm. to Barbados, which right. is huge. Right. You know, having, you know, not to go to Miami and, you know, the, you know, delay and the wait over, all of that helps, right? Mm -hmm. So we got a direct flight. Right. Um, parents were on board. Yeah, yeah. You know, the cowbells, the drums were on board. <laughs> yeah, yeah, So yeah. we walked in, man, and those parents had the stadium for themselves, man. Wow. I mean, we were even louder than the Bayesian crew, right? <laughs> wow. So yeah, yeah. the DJ would come on, anyone in the house from Bahamas, and yeah, they yeah, would yeah, just, yeah. They would just you know, light so up, right? Yeah, the kids <laughs> fed off of that, you know, yeah, you know hats yeah. off to the parents. They did an outstanding job. You know, supporting the team, um, and anything we needed, um, you know, just just that energy, you know, really feeds off, and the yes. kids really, 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 um, you know what I mean? Like, you know, right. yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah. so, excellent job, parents. You know, yeah. I encourage them to keep on traveling with us. Um, huge supporters, and you yes. know, we couldn't we couldn't do it without them. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Still to come on our news, Greg Thompson takes a second look at weather, and let's hear about the upcoming series Spotlight on Digital Transformation. That's coming up when our news returns. Welcome back to our news. Let's check back with Greg, who was at the Weather Center with the extended weather forecast. Greg? Thanks again, Megan, and welcome back, everybody, for our second look at weather. Stationary frontal boundary across the northwest Bahamas, weakening as we speak. It's going to continue to generate some showers across the area, so isolated thunderstorms will also be in your forecast. Most of the activity will hang out towards the uh, west of us, closer to the Grand Bahama and the Florida area. But because that boundary is in our vicinity, more showers and thunderstorms expected in the forecast through tomorrow. Eventually, its frontal boundary will weaken. High pressure will bridge that front as it slides out towards the east. That boundary is not expected to make it towards the south. Moisture will lift back towards the north starting on Sunday. High pressure will continue to generate some breezy conditions for us this weekend and into early next week. Boating forecast for the northwest Bahamas tonight to tomorrow. Small craft caution in effect for swells out there. East to southeast winds at 10 to 15 knots. Seas will be running 2 to 4 feet, but up to 6 feet in some swells. Your high tide will be at 8.03 tonight. For the central and southeast Bahamas, a caution fly for you guys down there as well, but more uh, stronger flow. East to southeast, 15 to 20 knots. Your seas will be running 4 to 6 feet over open waters. Here's a look now at your national forecast. A look now at your seven-day forecast through next Friday. Humid conditions expected through tomorrow and into the weekend, and then some breezy conditions by early next week. That's a look at our weather. Back to you, Megan. We wrap up Child Protection Month with an inside look at children's homes across the island. This week, we take a look at the Children's Emergency Hostel. And tonight, Ranfurly Home is appealing to you for financial assistance and volunteers to pour into the children. For her, this is a labor of love. You see, Brand Ambassador for the Ranfurly Home for Children, Bruniska Bullard says she has been in four of the children's homes on the island, with Ranfurly being her last. She says that at the home, caretakers focus on several development goals. 
As cliche as the term may be, education is indeed the key and their ticket out. So we really focus on that and hone in on that, whether that may be just tutoring sessions in the evening, um, having even some local companies are able to assist with private education for our kids. The second thing that we focus on is providing counseling sessions. I think it is important to not only care about education, but to help them in this healing process and help them, you know, heal from the trauma they would have experienced at some point. Rehabilitation and transitioning successfully out of the home is also important. Bullard says they aim to instill life skills, such as learning to drive and how to open a bank account. Our members of staff are very, very hands-on. And like I said, like they are more parental figures and they are the mom and dad that some of the kids would have not had. And so it's, I think it's, it's a daily thrive to constantly instill principles and morals into our kids. And then again, there are persons that come privately and um, are able to assist. So this is where more volunteer work comes in. There are persons that are very skilled. They, you know, would help the kids with budgeting. Like that's something that's really important for transitioning. They have to be able to save and to be able to, to just reach their goals. Ryan Frilly is a private home and Bullard says they depend heavily on donations. But she says caretakers rely heavily on the efforts of volunteers to help keep the safe haven open. I think sometimes we, we take for granted what relationships can do and the effect that they can have on the development of children because they feel as if someone cares and there are people there to, to look after them and want to know how their day is going and how best to, to help them through this process. So I would say I would encourage persons to donate financially. Um, it's been a really difficult time if they're able to, but also to come by and visit our home, like come and spend time with our kids. And don't forget to tune into Our News Presents Spotlight on Digital Transformation with host Candino Knowles this Sunday at 8 p.m. The show delves into the economic impact of COVID-19 and how it forced digital transformation in the public and private sector. That's this Sunday at 8 p.m. You don't want to miss it. And we thank you so much for joining us for Our News tonight. On behalf of the entire team, I'm Megan Shepard. We'll see you right back here tomorrow night. Until then, have a wonderful Friday evening.